Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. My, my goal is to talk about just a few of the facial subunits and some of the options for reconstruction in those areas here. Um, you know, so I'm focusing particularly today on the ear, the lips, and the nose, um, especially the internal lining and structure of the nose. You know, as Dr. Park was saying, when we look at a defect, it's not only categorizing where tissue can come from, what can move and what can't move, but having a rigorous approach to say, okay, what are my options for reconstruction in terms of simple to complex? And if you don't take this time to stop and make yourself think of these options, sometimes you can blow right past an option that's, that's simpler than your intended uh, reconstruction. So we, we've all learned about the reconstructive ladder. You know, most of the focus of this talk today is on local tissue uh, rearrangement, local flaps. But I'd like to just spend a few, uh, few seconds on each subunit looking at some of the simpler options as well, because sometimes that's actually your best option. Um, so to jump right in, we'll start with ears. Um, hopefully you don't end up like this poor gentleman here missing both ears. But one thing that's good in terms of ear reconstruction is they're, they're a fairly peripheral location. You know, they're not as aesthetically um, demanding as the center of the face. So, so your reconstruction doesn't, isn't seen centrally quite as often. And you have a nice template on the other side, usually, that you can balance your reconstruction on to, to look at the dimensions, the sizing, and those sorts of things. Other than that, however, ears are very difficult to reconstruct because they're this strange, complex, three-dimensional shape that's cartilage and skin projecting off the, the side of the head. So they're, they're very challenging to get just right. You may need to rebuild skin. You may need to rebuild the cartilage or both. And then while you're doing that, you also have to keep the external auditory canal open so you don't uh, interrupt hearing. Um, so working up that reconstructive ladder, secondary intention um, is, I would say, at, at best, it's a fair option for some very small skin only superficial defects, primarily in the concave subunits of the ear that are, are demonstrated here. The biggest problem obviously with secondary intention is scar contraction. So you know, be, be very careful about employing this in, um, in areas around the helical rim so that you don't distort the helical rim. If you allow this area to granulate too much, you may pull the helical rim in a bit. So just be conscious of what will happen to the surrounding tissue as you, uh, as you allow things to granulate. Um, and secondary intention is not that, not that much fun. So let's move on to something a little more enjoyable, right? So skin grafting actually is a simple, simple technique, but it often works really well for superficial um, auricular defects. So this example from Dr. Park actually shown here where you have primarily a skin only defect. Fortunately, the skin of the, the anterior um, in a, is actually thin and shiny and matches what an ultimate skin graft reconstruction may look like. So a skin only defect, you can apply a skin graft to, and it actually ends up healing very well as long as the base is pretty stable. You can also use it in certain cases like this one, this case shown on the left where a composite graft was taken from the concha. So skin and cartilage were removed, leaving just that posterior, uh, the base of the post, post auricular skin and you can cover that with a full thickness skin graft um, and it's, it's surrounded by you know, structural cartilage. So it ends up looking fairly natural with a pretty simple, um, simple technique. Um, so the skin graft, even though it's simple, can work well in some of these locations. Now, primary closure, you know, th this can be applied um, somewhat nicely in smaller helical rim type defects. So a lot of times we would treat a, a small lesion on the helix with a wedge type excision. Um, shown here. So usually, usually these are limited to defects about a centimeter, maybe a 1.5 centimeters in height, where you're, you're just literally cutting out a full thickness wedge, bringing the cartilage and the, the skin together. If you get larger than about that one and a half centimeters, um, you, really, you really risk creating sort of a cupping deformity, where you're shortening the height for sure, but you may also get some, some twisting or some bending of the auricular um, helix, and it really distorts the architecture. So in a smaller defect, you can just do a simple wedge. And when you're closing these, I think you gotta pay a lot of attention to reconstructing and reestablishing all three layers. So your cartilage layer, you know, typically would put a, like a PDS type suture through to get a nice strong um, support through the cartilage. And then your, your skin anterior and posterior, 
with particular attention to that helical rim itself, getting, getting really nice eversion on the helical rim so you don't get notching. You know, any free margin, we always, we always worry about that eyelid, lip, ala, you really don't want that to, to notch back up. So a strong everting stitch at that point is critical. This will make the uh, oracle shorter. And there's a certain amount of that that our eye doesn't even perceive. You know, when a when an ear is up to 10 to 15 percent shorter than the opposite ear, our eyes don't even pick that up on a casual glance. So we have a little wiggle room with, with some things. Um, in certain cases, you can also extend incisions here along the helical rim and create some helical rim advancement flaps as well, just depending on the on the size. This is an example of a defect that's a little too big for that. So if you just tried to close this with a simple wedge, just by taking out the, the defect here, you're going to bring these um, helical rims together and they're going to end up kind of creating a cupping or a, a loppier type deformity. So not only shortening the vertical height of the oracle, you, you actually need to shorten the horizontal height uh, or the horizontal width by taking out an additional excision here, full thickness. So you're creating an ear that's narrower and shorter, but preserves the overall architecture. So at a, at a glance, this still looks like a normal ear and it, it's a little smaller than the other side, but at a glance, people hopefully won't even perceive that. So when the defects get a little bigger, you have to consider um, extending your excision to a, a star or sometimes people call it a pentagonal type of um, excision. Now local flaps uh, for the ear, you know, th these actually aren't quite as common because so much of the ear is a fixed structure where the skin is adherent to the underlying cartilage. So a conchal bowl defect or a lobular defects where it's soft tissue, maybe where we would employ some local flap options a little bit more. Um, the defect shown here is kind of an, an interesting one where some of the external auditory canal is involved and some conchal skin. The rest of the oracle is really preserved. Um, so you have some neighboring tissue, in this case, temporal parietal fascia can be, can be brought in as a base for the ear ear canal reconstruction, which was done with a skin graft. And then that post-auricular island flap, I apologize, I don't have great examples showing the flap being moved around, but in, in this case, it's a, an island from the post-auricular sulcus. So you make your skin paddle right in the sulcus behind the ear, um, and you develop it as a subcutaneous island flap, which can then be brought through the defect onto the anterior surface. So that's this skin here came from the post-auricular sulcus, with its subcutaneous um, island pedicle, and then you just close the donor site primarily. You can actually use this flap as well for a, a through and through defect if you fold it on itself to, to help restore a through and through defect as well. So it's, it has a short reach, um, so it can't reach very far, but it does have some good applications in that sense. Um, or if the lobule is, is missing as well, if you had a defect down in this region, you can do a, a transposition type flap from the posterior skin rotate that around to restore soft tissue only. One other comment about lobular reconstruction is you may want to consider putting in some hard tissue like a cartilage graft when you're rebuilding a lobule. It may seem counterintuitive because there's no cartilage missing there, but if you have just soft tissue to reconstruct the lobule, that'll end up contracting and, and shrinking down a little bit. So putting a little cartilage in there helps it keep its shape a little bit better sometimes. Posterior skin can also be a nice source for um, for flaps that help restore the a bigger defect along the helical rim. So again, this is one of uh, Dr. Park's examples, but a defect involving cartilage and skin of the helical rim, you, know, you need to restore all three layers. So a conchal cartilage graft is used to restore the helical rim. Now you need vascularized skin covering over that graft. So posterior skin is a great option where you can raise this bipedicle tube flap in an interpolated fashion. So this lifts over top of your cartilage to restore the skin lining, temporarily kind of pinning the ear back, if you will. Um, but that, that serves um, as an, an interpolated flap to perfuse that cartilage graft. And then you come back later and serially divide each of these pedicles. So you have this, this intact pedicle here that's divided step one, and then the next pedicle can be divided um, subsequently. To, to really take a defect that's fairly complex in a protruding kind of three-dimensional location. Like it's tough to get local tissue to reach that area. Um, so in a series of stages, you can do that with the, the posterior um, tubed flap. This is a nice option. What about 
bigger defect. So if more cartilage is missing, more skin is missing. Here we have to get a little more involved and usually you plan for a multiple stage type procedure similar to a microtia type reconstruction. More commonly, um, you're relying on costal cartilage because contral cartilage will be insufficient. And it really depends on the character of your posterior skin to see if you have enough good, healthy posterior skin. Um, that can be an option to resurface the external skin. Otherwise, another option is to use a pedicle temporal parietal fascia flap just to give vascularized supply. And you cover that with a skin graft to help for a final skin covering. So I'll show a couple examples of, of each of these. Um, so this young lady had a, a, a piercing in this area that had got an infection and an incision and drainage. So it really has just um, cartilage damage, cartilage loss in the structure the, of the ear is just totally distorted. But the overlying skin is decent. So in this case, you know, the skin may be usable um, and the skin was very meticulously kind of cleaned off of the cartilage here. The cartilage is too weak and, and really condemned. So a, a costal construct was, was built again, much like a microtia type reconstruction. And you really need strong, firm cartilage to keep that skin on stretch. Again, like we were talking about with the, with the lobule, you need to almost over-engineer the structure to help keep the skin where you want it to be. But in this case, the skin was sufficient that it could kind of redrape over the costal cartilage to reform the upper, upper pole of the helix. Um, and then six months later, you know, it gives a much more kind of erect ear that looks a little more normal in appearance compared to where she started out previously. This case is even a little bit more uh, significant where there's not, not great skin in the pinna left. And if you look at her posterior um, hairline, the occipital hairline is very close to the ear. So if you try to use that posterior skin, you really risk transferring a lot of dark hair onto, um, onto the ear, which can be pretty off-putting and somewhat difficult to treat um, potentially later on. So in this case, you know, you'll need some structure. So a, 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 control or a costal cartilage uh, construct was, was created. Again, this is where it's nice to have the contralateral ear. So you can use this um, x-ray type paper, create a template from the opposite ear. You can sterilize that in, intraoperatively and position that over your, your rib cartilage when you're carving your cartilage to get all the nuances correct. Uh, this is showing a, a piezoelectric or a sonopet type of instrument to help really create some of those um, fine carving details in the rib without risk of going too deep, creating too much damage or kind of creating some unnatural grooves in that. Um, and then in this case, not enough good skin. So a, a pedicle TPF flap or temporal parietal fascia flap provides a nice thin vascularized uh, layer to nourish the cartilage. That's then covered with skin graft. Um, and you, know, you can take a, a pretty complex defect and make it look much more at a glance like an ear. Now, one problem with this skin graft, as you, you see this demonstrates, is the color match is a little bit worse. Um, so there are trade-offs with all of these situations. If you had used posterior skin, it's gonna be a hairy pinna versus a slightly hypopigmented pinna. So um, the, every, every option has, has pros and cons, of course. Um, so just to kind of briefly summarize with the ears, again, small skin-only defects, skin graft is really your go-to. That's going to be your most commonly used source. Maybe very small defects in isolated locations. You would consider letting things granulate in, but in, in general, skin graft will, will do a little better. Um, for those small to medium defects on the helix, that's where we're thinking about a wedge or a star type of excision, maybe with a helical advancement flap if needed. And then a conchal defect or a lobular defect where we're bringing in that posterior island flap or using that posterior local flap of some sort. When you get bigger cartilaginous defects, you need to restore that with bigger kind of cartilaginous constructs. So using rib cartilage with posterior skin or that pedicle TPF and a skin graft. Switching gears a little bit to lips now. So one, one big benefit for lips, they have great vascular perfusion. So they're very well perfused. And they, in general, have good laxity. You can see this lady here, she's, she's, she has a ton of laxity in her lips. Um, however, lips are also challenging because they're mobile, they're multiple layers, and they have this competing, competing issue of they need to close when you want them to close, to keep liquids in the mouth, keep oral confidence. Then they need to be open and compliant to eat, to speak, to smile, and all these sorts of things. So it, they're, they're pretty demanding um, in, the, in the functionality that's needed for this. Um, Again, moving through that reconstructive ladder, 
Secondary intention, really not a great option for, for most lip defects. And here are a couple of examples that have had some secondary intention and you have a, basically you have a free margin. Um, so if secondary intention will pull that margin, create webbing, shorten the height of lips. And, and once, you, once you've done that, it's really difficult to undo it. You know, maybe a small skin superficial defect in the filtrum that's kind of a concave subunit, you could consider a little bit of secondary intention, but in general, I would stay away from it for most lip defects. Um, skin grafting may be an option in some cases. Um, again, superficial defects, if it's mucosal lip or the cutaneous lip, smaller superficial defects you could consider. Um, the biggest issue you're fighting is contraction. So a full thickness skin graft is probably superior to a split thickness skin graft with less contraction. You may wanna even consider oversizing it just a little bit. Um, this shows an example of just a, a skin only defect involving the cutaneous and mucosal lip and a little bit of a cheek um, defect. So the cheek was advanced back to that natural nasolabial fold to put the lines you know, right where our eyes don't perceive them as well. Um, a template, I mean, use, use the opposite side whenever you have it. Make an exact template from the opposite side um, of the whole subunit. So in this case, you're following that subunit principle, the defect was enlarged a little bit back to the filtral ridge so that we, we had more of a complete subunit to replace. And that was replaced with a full thickness skin graft. The lip mucosa was advanced just as an advancement flap um, in this case. So this shows um, an early result where the skin graft is trying to live. And I, one thing I learned from this case is the importance of multiple bolstering sutures. So I think I had tried just one of the tie over bolsters to help immobilize this but the lips are so mobile themselves that you really need to try to fix the graft down as much as you can. So he had a few areas that were hypoperfused and a few areas of um, some graft necrosis. So his ultimate result, um, you know, it's the lip is not really distorted in terms of height too much, but the color is off, right? It's a, as a full thickness skin graft, it's hypopigmented, a little bit atrophic and not hair bearing. So if he wants to throw a mustache in here, it's, it's more of a challenge. Um, but still an option to consider for certain patients. And you know, the one thing this does is it doesn't, it, it doesn't blunt this nasolabial fold as much as a big cheek flap rotating all the way across. Um, okay, so primary closure. This, this is one that we use actually a fair amount for smaller lip defects. So you can think of a kind of a full thickness wedge excision, um, lip defects in the upper lip, maybe up to as large as a quarter of the length. The lower lip, maybe even a little bit larger, um, can be closed primarily. Here, the key is perfect alignment of that vermilion border. You know, studies have, have looked at one millimeter discrepancies in the vermilion to vermilion alignment. Those are perceived even at a quick glance. The casual observer will pick those up if it's a millimeter off. Um, so those are, those are kind of critical borders to realign. And the muscular border, the muscular attachments of the orbiculars is also critical. You have a nice strong like PDS suture there to really restore that muscular attention. Um, this example shows you know, a, a capillary malformation that had been expansive. And so the, the vermilion is a little bit less distinct. So it doesn't display that quite as well. The downside with any wedge excision is you give them a little bit of microstomia. You're using lip to rebuild lip. So there's always less lip at the end of the day. Um, but the benefit is it gives a functional result. You're using native lip tissue. So the color match is great, the functionality, the sense sensation is great as well. Just critical to kind of reapproximate all those layers. And again, at the vermilion, get nice everting stitches so you don't get any notching there. So use vertical mattress, horizontal mattress, plenty of, plenty of good sutures in that location. So skin only local flaps of the lip, um, those are, are really kind of the first choice option for most lip defects. You know, we, we saw a skin graft example, which feels okay, but looks a little um, hypotrope, uh, hypopigmented. When you're looking at lips, you have to consider all the subunits and hair growth, especially you know, in men, the beard distribution. So a lot of times a, a low, an upper lip defect, sort of like the one shown here, you have pretty limited options as to where you can recruit tissue from, right? I mean, you have a free margin down here that's, that's um, no go. You can't distort the nose. So really all you can do is bring tissue in laterally. So a, a lateral advancement flap um, with potentially this you take out a little extra tissue around the ala so you can advance a little more. It's kind of a main workhorse for upper lip defects. In this case, I tried to combine with a full thickness skin graft with a filtrum so that I reconstructed that defect separately. Again, I probably should have oversized that a little bit more because that's gonna contract um, just a little bit. 
larger defects, if you can't bring just lip tissue, you can consider a transposition type flap using medial cheek um, to, to kind of rotate that medial cheek down in. Again, then you're blunting a nasolabial subunit, so you're, you're following one rule to break another. So there's always, always unintended consequences that you have to consider in, in choosing these. Uh, one flap I really like um, for the upper lip is a V to Y island because it can follow those subunit principles and it, it doesn't blunt and distort things as much. So here's just one example of a lady who had uh, actually just a hypertrophic scar following trauma that was creating a lot of upper lip creep. So it's really distorting her upper lip, not a defect per se, but it, it essentially um, needed to be turned into a defect. This is one case where I show this to the residents and if you bill it to them as a scar revision, you say, okay, how would you revise this scar? They'll talk in vague terms, my residents did at least like, well, I would do a Z-plasty maybe or a something, something they think about it as a scar. Well, it really needs to be a defect. Like there's, there's not enough tissue there. So if you convert that into a defect, then your brain starts thinking about it maybe a little bit differently. So in this case, that's the first step. Release that condemned skin, release the mucosal lip back to where it needs to be, and then the V to Y is, is designed um, with incisions circumferentially around the skin, critical to keep the height of your flap. This height has to match the desired height of the defect. If this is too short, then you've recreated the same problem. You've hiked up the upper lip. So you have to carefully measure that and then kind of taper down from there back to your about 30 degree angle. So it doesn't matter as much how long this ends up being, it matters how high it is. So just some kind of pearls with dissecting this island flap, you can undermine the leading edge you need to to make it reach and the trailing edge a bit, but really you need to leave this center point um, intact. That's where its perfusion comes from. So it's a little bit of undermining, see how your tension is and until you can reach and then stop. Don't go any, any more than that. Um, so then when you're closing, a lot of times, if you close this point first, this where the V becomes a Y, that gives the flap a little push from below so you're not as reliant on pulling it from the from medially. Um, the nice thing with this flap, this is a kind of a year year post op. You it follows that natural curve. It follows the natural lip, so you're not distorting the nasolabial fold in this case. Um, and you can actually get a decent amount of recruitment to reach some of these defects. So I lose points for this slide because there's no pictures and it's too many words. Um, but this is sort of the textbook kind of algorithm that is in every textbook of how do you how do you reconstruct full thickness defects. Um, so again, lip is the best thing to use to reconstruct lip if you can. The, the trade-off is you're creating microstomia. So there's all these kind of criteria for with upper lip, how, how big of a defect can you reconstruct? With lower lip, how big can you reconstruct? Basic take home is the lower lip has more laxity. So a bigger lower lip defect can be reconstructed than the than an upper lip defect with the same type of flap you really have to weigh the functional benefits. So microstomia is always gonna be created when you, when you use lip to reconstruct lip, um, but you have the functional aspect. So bringing in a free tissue transfer may be necessary if the whole lower lip is gone, but it's, it's afunctional and you have a whole new set of um, issues to, to deal with. So I'm not gonna go through every single item on here because this is again, is, is the algorithm that you all are probably very familiar with. But this is the, the paradigm with what we think of with these larger full thickness uh, flaps. You know, really the, the Abbe and the Eslinder flap are the two sort of cross lip, lip switch flaps. We haven't really deviated too much from how they were both described in the 1800s. These are, these are taken from the original publications, the diagrams here. Um, so the Abbe flap, as you all are probably familiar, is a, is a cross lip flap for defects that don't involve the commissure. Um, classically, we talk about making the flap half the width of the defect. So when you bring the donor site together, you're sharing the tension of closure. So then the donor site is only half the width of the defect. You, you kind of spread out the flap when you um, reconstruct the defect and on the donor site, you're bringing it together only half as far. Um, but this requires a pedicle division about two to three weeks later, it's an interpolated type flap typically. Whereas the Eslinder is used for defects involving the commissure, it's a one stage procedure but it tends to pr produce rounding of the commissure. So oftentimes a, a delayed commissure plasty may be needed to improve symmetry. Um, so I just wanted to kind of walk through some, a little example of an Abbe flap, for, for example. So full thickness defect, you know, you're, not, you're probably not gonna be able to um, adequately bring in just local um, tissue here from the, 
the lateral side of the lip, you really can't bring much medially. So a lip switch, I think, is, is probably um, indicated for this gentleman. Again, preserving lip height is the key. You can't go back and restore lip height very well. You have to, you have to get that right. Um, so the textbooks will say, you know, your, if your defect is three centimeters, make your, make your flap one and a half centimeters. I think that's more true if your defect is in the lower lip. Because here, again, it's all about the symmetry of the lip subunit. So you have a template right here on this other side. So use that template. And in this case, I made my flap roughly the same size as the defect. Um, so this is one of those um, flaps you make full thickness incisions everywhere except the X. So I always draw an X on these. They don't cut here. That's the one little pedicle. Um, so everything's perfused off that labial artery. Um, everything else is full thickness. And this is the gut check portion of the, of the procedure. You've taken a moderately sized lip defect and made a very equal sized lip defect in the opposite lip and you hope it lives. But these things are amazingly well, well perfused as long as you preserve that little um, pedicle. Don't usually try to find the pedicle. You, know, you just know, know where it is and preserve that tissue. Um, closing the, the lower lip in this case helps relieve any tension. And then you inset your um, upper lip closure. So you've given them pretty severe microstomia for short term in this case. Um, a couple of weeks later, come back and kind of, again, carefully mark out the vermilion border, um, clamp your pedicle, and uh, then divide your pedicle and, and carefully inset this as well. So um, this shows just a little bit of the functional result that you can get with a cross lip flap, where he still, he has smaller mouth opening, but he's still keeping liquids in his mouth. He's able to eat and speak. Um, so it, it does re -innervate. both sensory and motor function re -innervates. Carapanzic flap then would be uh, an option for typically larger lip defects. So you, if you have a, a defect in the upper lip, about a half to two thirds, that's when you would consider a carapanzic lower lip a little bigger, again, 50 to 75% full thickness incision, um, but you're preserving the neurovascular pedicles. And so this is a single stage procedure potentially, um, but just depending on the size, there, there often needs some touch up procedures in the future. So one example of a large lower lip squamous cell um, here's the resulting defect. So basically, this is probably pushing the, the boundaries of what a carapanzic should do at about 80 to 90 percent, the lower lip. And unfortunately, she also has discoid lupus on top of this. So you see some of the skin changes associated with that as well. Um, again, I'm harping on this, but lip height is critical. You know, if you don't get enough lip height, you, you can't go back and easily reconstruct that. So really marking out how high do you want this uh, carapanzic flap to be and keeping that pretty uniform around the edge when you're designing that. So you can do a unilateral, or in this case, bilateral. Um, you make basically full thickness incision through skin, fat, and muscle. This is one thing I learned in, in some of my earlier cases where I was hesitant to disrupt some of the muscular attachments into the modilus, and then I just wouldn't get any movement. The modilus won't really move, and your commissure won't move unless you kind of separate those muscular insertion points, and you try to reestablish them at the end to the new commissure position. Um, but you need to preserve all these little nerves and vessels that you see running through, like the facial artery shown here. Mucosal incisions don't have to be as complete. You might not have, have to go quite as far in that case. Um, but this is, this is a kind of, a, in this case, a tight closure. And you see the limited vermilion here. Um, I did one little modification where a back cut in this location, just through skin only allowed that commissure to rotate around just a little bit more. But it's, you know, it's, it's functional, but it's a little tight to start. It's amazing how these relax with time. Um, so it left her with this after that first stage. So full mucosal upper lip, very, very limited lower lip mucosa. Um, so one technique to address that is to use upper lip mucosa to reconstruct lower lip. So we took an intra, intralabial bipedicled mucosal flap. Um, so it's getting blood supply from both sides and inset that into a defect in the lower lip to help restore the lower lip mucosa, to try to even those out a little bit. Um, the other issue with the large carapanzic flap is you get a lot of rounding of the commissure, which looks very unnatural. So a commissure plasty is, is common um, to follow these up. And there's multiple ways to do them. Lots of people have, have written and described um, different things. I, I, this one is a pretty straightforward one where you know, carefully mark where you want your commissure to end up at the end take out this triangle of skin, 
Um, I think this tacking suture right in here where you're tacking skin to mucosa is important so you don't get that to widen. Um, and then you rotate and advance mucosa to meet uh, the new position of your commissure and you see a, a, little, mo a little more of a um, angular commissure ideally. Um, so microstomia for sure with this flap when you're missing 80% of your lower lip and you're using lip to rebuild it, it's gonna be a smaller mouth, um, but you can get a functional, um, functional reconstruction with the care plan. So just to kind of summarize those again, small skin defects of the lips, full thickness skin graft maybe, and I would recommend um, reconstructing the entire subunit if you can. Uh, local advancement flaps are really most of your, um, your workhorse or your go-to. Larger skin defects, I, I really like a V to Y flap in the upper lip. You can use other types of advancement um, transposition flaps as well. And then full thickness defects, if it's small, um, a wedge works great, if it's bigger, you think about lip switch depending on the location. And then the really big ones, a carapanzic combination, sometimes a carapanzic plus an abbe, or starting to bring in non-lip tissue, like cheek advancement, Gillies fan flaps, um, all these sorts of things, or a free, free tissue transfer in certain cases. Um, okay. Last subunit here, we're looking at the nose. And Dr. Park nicely covered the uh, paramedian flap. So I'm gonna focus, I think, more on the lining and the structure. So the, the nice thing about the nose, you've got a great perfusion and you have a very great workhorse of a, a nasal skin flap available with a forehead flap. However, it's right in the center of the face. So you can't look anywhere but the nose. So the aesthetic uh, requirements are, are really high, especially you know, as, he, as Dr. Park was describing, it's no longer good enough to say, well, let's just fill the hole. Our goal is to let these people go back to the grocery store and go out to, to dinner and not have people stare at them and not have people even really notice unless they look closely. So that's, that's kind of the level of expectation we're, we're looking for in this. Um, oftentimes we really focus on that. What does the aesthetic result look like? And I would say that you can't get a great aesthetic result without really attention um, to the lining and the structure underneath that. So this case to me illustrated the importance of nasal lining it's really critical if your lining is deficient or if you overlook a lining defect, it's gonna come back to bite you in the end. Um, this gentleman had a septal mucosa squamous cell. And granted, it was a large um, resection, but he actually wasn't missing any nasal cartilage, any nasal um, structure other than the septum. And just a couple weeks later, you get intractable contraction of the nose and you can't restore that um, unless you've restored the nasal lining. So lining is, is definitely critical. For smaller lining defects, a, a composite graft can work nicely. Like in this case, this is a through and through defect here where you're looking at septal mucosa. So a composite graft from the concha provides skin for lining and some cartilage for support. Um, so you can use this, as long as it's covered with a vascularized flap, you can use this um, for smaller defects. Turn-in flaps are also a, a nice option if you have a healed um, wound. In this case, there was a fistula after previous um, cancer resection, radiation, forehead flap. So we have this skin that we're gonna get rid of. So you can just lift that, turn that into the wound to, to turn external lining into internal lining. You can use that for part of the internal lining defect or the whole thing in certain cases. One, just one caution is when you're hinging a flap like this, it can have, it can be kind of taxing on the vascularity. So occasionally you think about delaying that first if you're really worried about it, um, but it can be a nice, nice option if it's skin you're gonna throw away anyway. Really one of the main workhorses though is the intranasal lining flap. So septal mucosa, you have a lot available. Turbinate flaps um, could be an option or even um, fam flaps from the oral mucosa. So this is nice because it, it reconstructs lining with lining. So you're using like tissue to repair the defect. Um, and there's, there's usually ample supply. Um, so a septal flap can be harvested either ipsilaterally, like seen here where it's based anteriorly on the anterior septal artery. A contralateral septal flap can be um, raised for a, a sidewall defect. So we're going through the ipsilateral um, lining through the cartilage, taking the cartilage graft in the septum and then hinging your contralateral um, lining flap to restore the inner lining to it here. And this is showing a fam flap taken tunneled up from inside the cheek um, to restore a lining defect that was in the nasal sill on the side. I'm actually a big fan in some cases of a folded forehead flap. If you have a smaller um, lining defect where you, you just extend your forehead flap a little higher and fold that around the alar margin. The downside of this is it requires an extra stage because you can't put in your structural cartilage at the time. So th this defect here is primarily skin and some structure, but you see the red is the um, inter, internasal lining defect. 
So you make a separate template from that at the very peak of your forehead flap. Um, the external skin template sits below that. Leave a millimeter or two for it to fold around itself. Um, so the initial inset doesn't look great if you have this kind of blocked nostril and a kind of amorphous look to it. But at your next stage, you can come back and make your incision exactly where you want that alar margin to sit. You lift the forehead flap thinly, put in your structural grafting, um, and then you set the flap back down. You divide the pedicle then later. So this can create a little more of a, a smooth ala lining in some cases. Big downside though can be hair growth if you extend it into the hairline. So be, be cautious of that. And then um, pre-laminated forehead flap is one that I'll use sometimes for a larger nasal defect. So um, pre-lamination means that you lift the forehead flap, put skin graft on the undersurface, and you lay the forehead flap back down so it, it undergoes some contraction while it's in the forehead. Um, so in this case, his cephalomucosa was not, um, not actually very usable because of a vascular in interruption. So the forehead flap is lifted, skin graft placed on the backside. And when you come back at the next stage, you have a skin graft that's integrated into your forehead flap. At this point. And that can be transferred as a two layer flap at that point. Again, it, it adds a stage. So you have to do a delayed cartilage grafting down the road, but it can provide some good um, internal lining when there's deficient internal lining options available. Um, again, I'm going to skip skip through this wordy slide, but, but the primary cartilage supports we have are septal, auricular, and costal, and it kind of depends on what you need in terms of which ones that you will use. So septal cartilage is the most available. As long as you preserve the L-strut um, for the septal and nasal support, you can get a decent-sized graft. Um, this is just demonstrating that same defect we showed before, where you're, you're lifting the ipsilateral flap, removing your cartilage graft, and that's restoring your structure. Um, and then you cover that with a pair of medium forehead flap for um, external skin lining. Auricular cartilage is great if you want a flexible graft or if you want a, like an ALR sidewall um, or non-anatomic ALR graft, you can use conchal cartilage or concha cavum, concha simba. You can also, so these two locations are great for kind of structural grafts. You can use a composite graft as well, uh, like the helical root or this anti-helical root if you want a three-layer graft where you get skin cartilage and an opposite layer of skin, this can work nicely for a very, very small defect in the ALR rim itself. And then costal cartilage is our workhorse for multiple grafts when you do large um, dorsal support, as in this case, where there's no support in here. So we're taking a composite graft of cartilage and bone and really securing that up to the glabella to give improved dorsal support. All right, so summary of all, all of those sorts of things, lining options, support options. I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm skipping through this to get to some of the more fun um, discussion cases that we have coming up here. Um, so we wanted to try to get a little bit of um, some challenging cases and some managing complications to hopefully get a little bit uh, from, from you all uh, as well in terms of what, how, how you would manage these sorts of things. Um, this is a, a case that um, presented a bit of a challenge. This gentleman had a previous nasal skin cancer reconstructed with a forehead flap. He's cancer free, but his forehead flap is unfortunately too small. So he still essentially has a full thickness nasal defect. He's missing lining structure and skin. This is his original um, skin paddle for his forehead flap. To complicate matters a little bit, his, his um, Skin paddle was taken from the left forehead, but the pedicle was taken from the right. So it's a very oblique design. Both foreheads are, are now scarred. And then he's had a little bonus basal cell removed from this location as well, just to make things even, even easier. So, um, so I'm kind of throwing this out to, to everyone. I know we can't be quite as interactive as in, in, in a live setting, but how would you reconstruct this defect? And maybe I'll even ask Dr. Park, I know he's still on as well, but you know, what, how, do, how do you approach something like this? Well, I'll take a first stab. Uh, you're right. I mean, it, another way to look at it is just a short nose. Um, so it it probably needs rib. Uh, obviously, I don't think there's enough lining, and you're deficient on skin and internal lining. So it's uh, it's it's effectively like a dog bite to the tip of the nose. <laughs> uh, and so it's an L strut composite graft or something for the ala, and then you need to cover all that. And that's unfortunate with the forehead. I'd, I'd probably do, a, if I were to do it, I'd probably do a medial labial flap, a big one, <laughs> and just from the cheek, 
bring it all the way over to the nasal tip. Uh, I think it can be done. I think it can, he, things can be improved a little bit. Um, probably need to overcorrect it just a touch. Tough one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll send them your way. And I don't know if there's any way for, for anyone else to, to chime in at all, but I can kind of, I think it's, it, it's an interesting one because we could all come up with different options as, as you as you would heard as you have heard. Um, so my approach was again to use a, use another forehead flap because that vascularity is so prominent that you can you can raise a second forehead flap from the same side. Um, the hard thing in this is getting the right three dimensional size of the nose because the nose is truncated. It's a short nose. So I use this kind of intraoperative putty to try to rebuild what I wanted the nose to look like three dimensionally to base my template for the forehead flap. And this is just showing all the scars that he, he had. I, I decided the, the forehead in this location was the least scarred, so that would be my nasal skin, but I was a little bit unsure about the vascularity here. So for me, I did a, a vascular delay of the forehead flap initially where I leave little, left little bridges of skin here, just kind of partially elevated and set it back down to allow to kind of train the vessels to follow the direction I wanted them to go. I also did a little vascular delay on some um, turn-in flaps, which would help restore some of the internal nasal lining since I was doing a delay stage anyway. Um, as you said, he needs structure, so I took rib and, and did use that for kind of a caudal septal extension graft, put some spreader grafts in there, kind of a rhinoplasty um, type grafts to really restore the nasal projection, as you said. Um, I use some composite auricular grafts as well. So that's what you see the backside of here. So that's turned in and you have those turn in flaps to restore the internal lining. And then this is what I was looking for to really restore that projection from the lateral view. Um, I did a couple additional grafts, just tip, tip onlay and some lateral sidewall grafts really to help him um, functional aspects. And then covered that with the forehead flap. So I, I did this as a full thickness uh, subgaleal the whole way, which, which meant I uh, gave him a very bulky flap to start. So it came back and elevated the flap entirely again on its pedicle, which left this kind of um, very well vascularized and integrated cartilage grafts at this point that you can sculpt a little bit into the desired shape you're looking for for the nose, thin the overlying forehead flap and replace it. Um, and then ultimately get him a nose that's breathing better and looks a little more like a nose. You know, it, I'm not sure this totally passes the grocery store test, especially, you know, with the forehead scar, it's probably as visible as anything else, but something that doesn't look like a dog took off the tip of his nose. But challenging case for sure. That's excellent. I don't know how we are on, if we have time, but I have one more that's just a complication. It's a challenging case followed with a complication management. So it's, it's a good one, I think a good one to, to show for for, I learned a lot in this case for sure. Um, this is a nice gentleman, has a, a very aggressive basal cell that's been previously excised, now recurrent. The Mohs surgeon started excising and stopped due to depth of, of involvement. He's not been radiated in the past. Um, so he actually went to one of my head and neck cancer uh, partners who continued the excision, which extended into the bone, extended into infraorbital nerve. They actually followed this through the face of the maxilla opened up the maxillary sinus, traced it back almost to the orbital apex before they got a clear margin. He ended up with a full thickness nasal skin and um, a little bit of a sidewall full thickness through the mucosa defect. This picture was taken before they were done resecting actually and all of that soft tissue and fat was resected as well. So he's got a complex through and through defect, the cheek, the maxillary sinus, he's missing nasal skin, cheek skin, he's missing his levator lip, um, muscles as well. So the muscles were taken all the way down to the bone. Um, so again, I think this could fit in a complicated uh, case discussion as well um, in terms of how to reconstruct it. The thing I wanted to focus on actually is, is the complication. So um, here's what I tried. So I used some fascia lata just to occlude this, the maxillary sinus, just sewed it over the opening in the maxillary sinus. Also used it just to suspend the upper lip so it wasn't so totic since the muscles are all, all taken. Then I put a free fat graft um, for volume for bulk because advancing this cheek flap was gonna be too deficient in this case, I thought. Um, I used a composite graft here for the full thickness nasal defect rib graft to help just bolster the nose so it wouldn't rotate up as much and provide more structure. And then a cheek advancement and forehead flap. 
for external lining. You may already be able to see kind of what's coming. You look very carefully right in this location of the area of most tension. But a couple of weeks later, he comes back and he's had some necrosis of that medial cheek flap. And I'm worried about the compromise of the underlying free fat graft as well, because I have a lot of free grafts in this area. Um, this progressed to full thickness necrosis and the sinocutaneous fistula. Um, so now I look through this hole and I'm looking right into his maxillary sinus, which is kind of draining some, some gunk. And by the way, he's now started his radiation treatment. So any words of wisdom on this, on this case at this point? How would you, what would you, what would you do next, do you think? Oh, if you're asking me. Well, sure, I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, I don't know, Sam. Man. Um, well, I think I mean, we've all seen it. As a rule, I increase my uh, interval for a follow-up a little bit. Uh, in other words, just give it time. I mean, I, I don't think I would, I, I would get him through his radiation. Probably before I tackled it, I'd get in some HBO um, and then do something. But, but I don't think I would intervene acutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I was planning to even wait on his pedicle division until after radiation. So he was already, you can see how happy he is with me with this expression right here. I think yeah. that it's kind of given the picture, but so I'm making him wait to divide this until radiation. And then he gets this. I tried a few little local, local options to try to, you know, encourage granulation tissue, but it's, you know, none of that was really, really working. So this was my attempt at a salvage after his radiation. You know, the forehead flap was full thickness and needed to be thinned anyway. So I thought, well, instead of throwing away that frontalis muscle, why can't I just hinge that back and cover the, cover the fistula? The fistula is kind of small at this point. So I lifted the forehead flap. This is frontalis. That was the extra fullness. I just hinged that on itself and tucked it into the defect, hopefully provide some vascularity, planning to cover that with a skin graft later if it, if it lived. Um, so that was kind of my Hail Mary to, to try to Try to salvage it. Maybe not surprisingly, it didn't didn't work. The fistula got a little bit smaller, but now he's he's, he's happy still. You can tell, very happy with how things are going. Um, so now we're still dealing with this this fistula. So now, what are your options? I don't feel like I could advance this very well because all of this had been radiated and was starting to fix down a little bit. So I went with the second forehead flap. He's got he's got two good foreheads, right? Um, so in this case you know, cut back to healthy bleeding tissue and used the ipsilateral forehead flap just to provide nice, I knew that was not radiated, nice vascularized tissue to help patch up the, the fistula there. He also actually underwent a maxillary entrostomy to provide drainage for some of the sinus contents that were building up. So I did this to this poor guy. I mean, now you can see how thrilled he is. I think he's, he's actually slightly smiling because he's probably plotting his revenge at some point. Um, but it, it ultimately vascularity won the day. So it, it ended up healing. Um, it ended up fully, fully healing. He's, he's now more than a year out and we're waiting to do some final issues where his, he lost some of that fat graft volume. So his skin has now stuck down to his um, maxilla. He unfortunately got a bad um, mycobacterium infection in this process as well. So has, has had a few other setbacks, but um, you know, is this going to pass the grocery store test? I don't think so. At this point, we have a few other things kind of planned potentially, but um, I, I welcome other thoughts as to other ways to manage that. But that was that was kind of what I came up with going through all those. I tried secondary intention, local flaps, and ultimately ended up going going a little bigger and uh, seemed to seemed to at least get us out of that jam. Yeah, good good recovery, Sam. I think everybody is muted, so so they're not able to. to no problem. Yeah. Sure, that's, that, that was an amazing, amazing talk. Um, I think, you know, on, on the last case, I don't know if you would consider something like a free radial forearm flap, especially in the initial, you know, in the initial stages, I think uh, knowing that he would go for radiation, I, I would have uh, considered that because I would, uh, you know, it, take it as large as possible and get my lining and cover you know, from it. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, great point. I mean, that certainly could have been a free flap defect. Um, the, the thing 
the challenge with a radial forearm, I think in that case would be the thickness, because that would still be a pretty thin covering for that entire thick cheek defect, but um, no, that would have been better vascularized um, or color match potentially, but um, yeah, I think, I think that certainly, certainly couldn't be faulted for doing a free flap in that case. Thank you. And before I go to the questions on the screen, the, you know, the other thing that we have, the other problem that we have with the forehead flaps in uh, black patients in particular, I don't know if you have that experience as well, is hyperpigmentation. Um, you know, you, we now shy away from just getting the subunit, reconstructing the whole subunit because they just uh, you know, get terrible hyperpigmentation and you can't do anything about it. You can't demo braid, you can't, you know, you you essentially stuck and the the flap will contract so badly sometimes that you, you'll regret putting it there. So I don't know if you have that uh, kind of experience as well and maybe a solution of how we can get around it. I, I have definitely, I, I've, probably done two or three forehead flaps. Um, I can think of off the top of my head, uh, African-American, and you're exactly right. They got their hyper pig, they, they definitely don't blend in. Um, mm. I, I, honestly, I don't recall necessarily having more contracture of the flap than uh, in other flaps. And I definitely don't have a solution. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you're doing a, it's unusual, fortunately, and, and I think one of them was not skin cancer, it was trauma, actually. Um, but but I, I don't have a good answer to, to prevent that hyperpigmentation. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that. Same. same, um, same. I, have, I have a question from Jason, who says, uh, great talks and interesting cases. What are your thoughts and experiences on using pericranial flaps in those cases? Yeah, I, I responded. Um, yeah, so I didn't know we were going to read these. Yeah, I, I, um, I like that flap. I've done it a few times. It's just not very robust. And so I've used the pericranial flap for internal lining. And a couple of times I grafted, mucosal grafted underneath. And a couple of times just let it mucosalize by itself. And um, came out okay, but but just when you look at that pericranial flap, it is, you know, it's not bleeding. It's not a really robust flap like um, the undersurface of your forehead flap. And so it always, you know, but fortunately, I don't think they, I think they're a little more sturdy. They don't contract as much. I mean, it's one thing to use a pericranial flap for a skull base reconstruction or CSF leak, but um yeah, done it a few times, uh, and you got to be a little tricky when you, you have to be thoughtful and planning when you're doing a forehead flap at the same time, right? Um, just in terms of the blood supply. But it works. And uh, the second one is um, I've done it a couple of times, but uh, oh, that was my response. Oh, okay. All right. I, I so read, I know Jason, and so. <laughs> Oh, I see. All right. And we have uh, one of our good friends, uh, Alex Diakakis. Um, where is he now? Um, there is. Uh, to Dr. Park, thank you again. Uh, regarding your median forehead flap, uh, how do you decide on the late uh, uh, laterality of the curve of your pedicle on the medial brow? Uh, for an example, ipsilateral or contralateral to your defect. Do right. you, oh, and do you graft the raw undersurface of the pedicle or just dress it? So I default to the contralateral. So I like to do contralateral whenever possible. Um, it has less arc of rotation. It's, it's not in their eye as much, um, but I will do ipsilateral if I need length. So if it's a unilateral defect, and I'm going down to the ailer rim and it's a low hairline, I would generally go ipsilateral, uh, but my default is contralateral. And no, I do not uh, graft the undersurface. A lot of people have um, done that. And I think if you have excess skin and you stick it on there, that's, that's one thing. Uh, I definitely wouldn't go, personally, even though people do, I wouldn't go harvest skin to put on the undersurface of that. I wrap it in zero form 
and it's a little bloody for a few days. Uh, I, I change it at about five days. And then sometimes, um, you know, after two weeks, I take it off, leave it off, and then they can, they can run, they can shower, shampoo, everything. Um, it's just not a big deal. But, but, but for probably about a week, it's a little messier than if you graft the undersurface, um, but only a week. <laughs> All right, and we have another one on um, our YouTube channel. Uh, it's Daniel saying, great presentation. I was wondering if you have a protocol uh, of when there is suffering of the forehead flap or maybe a salvage of a forehead flap. Sam, do you do anything? That was a question of protocol of when you section it? No, no. Uh, it, I think if the flap is suffering, whether it's congestion or necrotic, yeah. uh, at whatever, two weeks. Yeah, I, I think the key is to determine if you think it's a venous in, uh, uh, arterial insufficiency, which is usually not the case, or a venous congestion, which is more commonly in a, in a forehead flap. So if it seems congested um, and there's a particular choke point, you can try cutting a couple sutures out to see if that helps relieve any, um, any compression. Um, I haven't used it for this, but a, a, you know, leech therapy could be considered for a venous congested flap. Um, fortunately, they, you know, they're very well perfused. They're very robust. So they, they do very well overall, but no, I, I don't have a specific protocol. So I, I have had, um, uh, probably more than I care to admit, um, flaps where some small portion of it necrosed. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the distal two, three millimeters, wherever that might be, um, you know, you look at it and, and dead is dead and it's and then eventually is black. What I have done on occasion is taken them back and lifted the flap up again and mm -hmm. it, uh, dissect a little more up at the brow and advance it more caudally. So, you know, where, where, wherever that might be, if the distal two or three millimeters of the forehead flap dies, um, mm -hmm. rather than let it heal by second intention, I've lifted it up and advanced it a little further and then closed it again and then restart the clock and divide, and divide three weeks after that. I, I've probably done that with both forehead flaps and medial labial flaps a handful of times. Excellent. Okay, so we have another one from Shah Wali. Um, do you address taking a f taking flap from skin exposed to radiotherapy? Um, I mean, skin damaged by radiotherapy. I think I'm, I'm not sure, Shah. If you you're on, can you just please unmute yourself and just you know uh, explain the question further to us? I, I'm going to take it that you mean, uh, can you raise a flip that has been damaged by radiotherapy? But I'm not sure if that's what he's asking. So we have definitely done forehead flaps in irradiated tissue. But if you, I guess if you were to say damaged irradiated tissue, um, you know, no, I think, if, I think if the skin didn't look healthy, then I would not do that. If that is the question. Excellent. And um, I think the last one for me. Oh, is that Shah coming on? Yeah. Ma'am, I would uh, like to ask that if we are taking the forehead flap from that side and this skin is damaged already by radiotherapy, so how will you take the flap from that side? Do you mean if the forehead is damaged? Yeah, yeah. You know, to be, to be honest with you, Shah, it's really hard to, to sort of um, give a, a definitive answer because it, it sort of depends. If it's really damaged, then I don't. Uh, but well, quite frankly, I, I look at the forehead very closely because many of these people have had multiple malignancies. And if there are several scars on the forehead running transversely from previous Mohs excisions, that makes me very nervous. I think you're describing something that beyond that, where, where the skin is very unhealthy. Uh, I, I think you're really pushing your luck. 
Um, but in general, uh, on occasion, I've treated these, um, particularly these radiated areas um, like, uh, or with preoperative hyperbaric oxygen. So they get 20 dives, just, just like a Marks protocol. You know, I give them 20, it's a very labor intensive. They get 20 dives before I do my surgery and then they get 10 after. Um, I, I definitely don't have a big enough series to tell you that that, that that works, but I have done that. All right. I think we've gone through all the questions, but I would just love to ask, um, uh, do you uh, offer any fellowships, any, you know, can uh, we come and visit your unit, our registrars? Because I think that uh, the work that you've done, you know, you're doing both of you is excellent. So we would um, definitely, you know, benefit from coming to visit or, you know, arranging for registrars to come for fellowships. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great because Sam and I are together now. Uh, mm. Well, we'll be in a month. Um, so yeah, we have, we have visitors come all the time. Um, the, the easiest way is to just email and then and start that process. And just to be an observational fellow, I, I, I usually limit it to two weeks. Um, and quite honestly, it's because it just it just gets a little too boring. <laughs> um, so uh, an observational someone who's just going to come watch how we do things. Uh, two weeks. Someone who wants to um, be a fellow with privileges to, to operate, and so a full, like our full fellow, they need to be ECFMG certified, and they have to get a, a state license and take their USMLEs, um, and when they do that, then they apply, and we, uh, yeah, we, we take fellows in, in that capacity. Excellent. So, um, you know, in line with the tradition of Sosa, can you both give us, the, you know, your three uh, words of wisdom, like advice on what to do or what never to do in facial plastic surgery? Sam, you better go first. <laughs> I have, you have more wisdom, though. Um, that way it's wide open for you. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Three. <laughs> so I, th I think... Number one, like this sounds simple, but always listen to your patient. Um, the times that I've gotten in, you know, had more regrets has been when I've thought, you know, I know what this, I know what this patient or this treatment, I know what they need. And you don't match that with what the patient's telling you they need. Because um, you can get a great result in, in what is important to you, but if that doesn't matter to that patient, then those are the unhappy patients that you, that are harder to recover from. So listen to your patient. I mean, the other simple thing is measure twice. Um, and, and I mean that not only in physical measurements, but even your, your eyes can deceive you. So sometimes you're looking at a defect or a flap or a reconstruction or a rhinoplasty for that matter. Look at it from the opposite side. Look at it from upside down. Take out that natural tendency for us to fill in the gaps where our brain will fill in to help us see what our eyes think we should see and try to look at it in a pure geometric shape um, to see if it really passes the, passes the test. Um, I guess the third uh, thing would be the thing that I try to, to do is to say, always, always keep striving for improvement. You know, there's a, people will sometimes say, oh, the enemy of, of uh, perfection is better, or, or I might've messed that up a little bit, but the enemy of good is better. There's, there's all, all types like that. Um, which can often be something people say if they sort of feel like cutting corners or feel like stopping. And I would, I would challenge myself and everyone to always try to strive for that next step. You know, don't, don't do things that are unsafe, but always try to strive for perfection. That's what our whole specialty is about, trying to either recreate or improve upon that perfect ideal. And we can never get there, so we might as well keep trying. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, that, that's great, Sam. So I'll, I'll give maybe um, a little more concrete. Um, uh, although I completely agree, and, and the residents kind of tease me that um, that I don't subscribe to perfection is the enemy of good. Um, so so we 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 go all the way and try to make it absolutely as perfect as possible. You know, under a lot of magnification. But but I think my concrete pearl would be particularly as it pertains to this kind of a talk or this um, uh, and this audience is. Um, a lot of these skin defects come from skin cancer, uh, and 
you know, I'm almost on a little bit of a campaign to be very careful as um, as primary surgeons, whether we're plastic surgeons or otolaryngologists, um, to be cutting skin cancer out. And I, and I say that, and I know, of course, there are many circumstances where you have no options, but um, I say that because I see a fair number of recurrent. And you go back in the his story, and many times it's an otolaryngologist cut it out and, and you know, sort of check the margins. And two, three years later, it's back and it's an entirely different animal. You know, it, and it's a 60 year old, you know, who's now gonna lose three quarters of their nose. And in my mind, I can't help but thinking a few years ago, truth, there was a mistake. And that is when we tackled it and we cut out that, you know, we didn't do Mo surgery. We sent it and we, you know, put our little sutures and blew away and, and they checked less than 1% of the margin. And we bank on that path report that says margins clear and we do our little local flap. And I've seen so many of those come back um, with, with really large defects. And, and uh, so, so I would say, uh, let, let's be careful uh, as uh surgeons who are cutting out skin cancer to, to in particular, be very careful of in aggressive infiltrating uh, malignancies and recurrent ones or ones in radiation or burn fields and, uh, you know, low threshold to, um, to send on to a Mo surgeon or, or, or pass on. You know, I think it's also important that we should, um, we need to be able to swallow our pride at times. I mean, I, I really admire otolaryngologists who say this is above my head um, and, and pass it on. I think sometimes we get kind of stubborn and, and maybe a little bit proud and we bite off more than we can chew. So why don't I just leave it at that? And I know the hours. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Dr. Oya. I think um, you guys are just were just amazing tonight. And, um, you know, I have to thank uh, Dr. Brian Wong for, you know, just connecting us because we wouldn't have known that you we have such wealth that is available to us. You know, you, you gave us such wealth of skill and knowledge. Um, so we you know, we want to invite you as friends of sources to come to our Congress next year. And thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Dion wants to add something before, um, you know, we log off. Dion, are you still there? Okay, I think he's, he's already gone. He was here a minute ago. But um, please join us next week for, you know, as we run up to towards the World uh, Rhinoplasty Day, we having you know quite an amazing series of talks until World Rhinoplasty Day. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Okay, thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Take care. <laughs>